when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. the day in your presence all our fears are washed away it's when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away is in the hands 
of the maker of heaven I give it all to you God trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me I give it all to you God trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me
Make your way to uh, Ezekiel 33, and I'll pray. Lord, we're, we're so, so thankful. So, so thankful that you are such a good, wonderful, loving God. And that, Lord, you are interested so much in the sanctification of your people. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, said, This is the will of God for your life, your sanctification. And tonight, Lord, Ezekiel will talk about those same things. And Lord, we'll see a portion of Scripture tonight that is just so powerful. It reveals so much about who you are and your character, your heart for sinners to turn back to you, to provide salvation through Jesus Christ. Lord, we're just going gonna, gonna to see so much in, in this 33 verses of chapter 33. So we pray tonight, Lord, that by your spirit, you would come and you would speak to us, that you would be our teacher, and that nothing I say tonight, Lord, would be out of bounds or incorrect. And should that happen, Lord, it would just fall upon deaf ears. We we pray tonight, Lord, that we would grow in our relationship with you tonight, and we would receive the challenges that are laid out for us in Ezekiel 33. So we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanted to mention that last week we had our worship in the park, and it was such a sweet night of worship, and I want to just encourage everybody. I want to thank those who came out and made it such a great evening. Uh, it, was, it was packed. I think we had almost 200 people from Calvary Chapel Greer there, and it was a sweet time. I just wanted to say thanks. We are making plans to do these regularly, um, not every week, not even every month, but to be able to do it a number of times a year. So we're working on that, and you'll hear announcements as we go. But our midweek series in the book of Ezekiel is titled The Glory of God, and tonight we come to yet another major turning point in the book. It's the third major section that we're beginning. It's the last section of the book of Ezekiel. And so I thought it would be a good night to begin with kind of a high-level overview and review of how we got here. So if you'll remember, it was in um, 605 BC that Nebuchadnezzar marched his armies against the city of Jerusalem and Judah. He invaded Judah and he put a vassal king on the throne and he carried off to Babylon the brightest and the best of the young Jewish men. That's when Daniel and his three friends were taken to Babylon, and the Jews didn't do a very good job of submitting to Babylon, and they didn't do a very good job of submitting to the vassal king that Nebuchadnezzar put in place, and this upset him. So then in 597 BC, he brought his second invasion of Judah, and it was at that time he put a different king in charge, and he carried off more of the Jews to Babylon, and that was when Ezekiel was carried off to the city of Tel Abib outside of the capital of Babylon. And so the first section of Ezekiel covers the nine-year period that took place between the second 
and the third invasion of Jerusalem. We're, we're just basically waiting for the city to fall at this point. And, and the first section is presented in two parts. Chapters 1 through 3 focused on the call and uh, the preparation of Ezekiel for the task that God was calling him to. Ezekiel had been preparing to be a Levitical priest and to serve in the Jewish temple. And then he gets carried off to Babylon and God tells him, listen, you're, you're not going to be a priest. You are going to be a prophet. And your job is going to be primarily to prophesy to the Jewish captives living in Babylon. And at the same time, if you like to compare Scripture with Scripture, Jeremiah was still in the city of Jerusalem. He's preaching to the people that are still there. And he's telling them that the city's going to fall, that Babylon is a tool in the hand of God to judge them. And the people did not believe him. Chapters 4 through 24 contained Ezekiel's detailed prophecies about the wickedness of the Jewish people and the coming judgment of God. And then we got into the second section that covered chapters 25 through 32. And what, what God did there is he told Ezekiel, I want you to proclaim judgment against seven Gentile nations that surround Judah, but they also contributed to or gloated over the fall of Judah. So God says, we're going to judge them, and we studied those in detail, and, and that brings us to the third section, which covers chapters 33 through 48. And in this section, Ezekiel's message begins to change. In the final section here, Ezekiel focuses on giving prophecies about the restoration of Israel and her future blessings. And so we're going to see that God is going to tell the Jewish people, I'm bringing you back to the land. And then he gives these far-reaching prophecies, some of which we saw fulfilled in the last hundred years, where God's going to bring the Jewish people back to the land. He's going to make Israel a nation again. He's going to give them a prosperous future. And so what God is basically saying here in this next section, he says to his people, yes, you sinned. Yes, I judged you. But unlike the Gentile nations that we just talked about in the previous chapters, God now says to his covenant people, I made some promises to you. And just because I had to discipline you and judge you because of your sin doesn't mean that those promises have become null and void. And God now begins to proclaim that he's going to fulfill his promises to his covenant nation. So our goal for tonight is to go over the 33 verses in Ezekiel chapter 33. And we're going to title this message, Be Faithful. And I believe that this is an extremely relevant study for you and I living as New Testament believers in the year 2024. And so let me tell you how we're going to approach this. We're going to take a section of chapter 33, and I'm going to teach it in its historical context. We're going to talk about how it applied to the people it was written to, and then we're going to draw parallels from each section so that you and I can have an application from tonight, because this is a very, very highly applicable chapter. So let's set the scene by reading Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 1 and 2. Only part of 2, but read with me. It says, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, and, and we're going to pause right there. I want you to see that once again, we are reminded of the source of Ezekiel's prophecies. Notice it says here that the source was the word of the Lord that came to me. I want you to keep this in mind for a minute because when we get to the end of the study, we're going to be reminded of something we learned in chapter 3. And I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag because I just can't hold my... In chapter 3, God said to Ezekiel, he said, I'm going to cause your tongue to stick to the roof of your mouth. And what he went on to say is that Ezekiel... From this point forward, you are going to be unable to speak except for when I give you my word to speak to the people. Tonight in chapter 33, God brings that to an end and Ezekiel gets to freely preach whatever he wants now. But up to this point, Ezekiel was only speaking the word of the Lord that came to, me, to him. He says there, he wanted to make sure 
that his audience understood that this was God's word, not his. This was not his thoughts. It was not his ideas. It was not his opinions about God. He wanted the people to understand that he was receiving God's word and then he was processing it and then faithfully delivering it to its intended audience. And I feel very strongly that that is a template for the New Testament pastor teacher. I believe very strongly that this is something that more and more pastors need to adopt as a template for how they build their ministries. Instead of having this idea where a pastor just spends all week trying to figure out what he's going to talk about, and then he gets up on Sunday and he reads a couple of verses, and then, you know, he spends the rest of the hour, or from what I've seen, 35 minutes. I can't even do my introduction in 35 minutes. But, but we have so many pastors today that are just simply sharing their thoughts, ideas, and opinions. In fact, sometimes they get up and they present an idea, and then they find scripture to back up their idea, instead of just letting the word of God speak. And, and this is what Ezekiel did. He didn't just try to wake up every day and go, oh my gosh, it's Sunday again. I gotta get up and say something. Ezekiel never opened his mouth unless the Lord was telling him what to say. And so I want to show you what the Apostle Paul wrote to his young associate, Timothy, regarding this thing that we're talking about, the, the template for how pastors should design and, and fulfill their ministry. And this is towards the end of Paul's life. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. He says, I charge you, therefore, and when we went over this recently on Sunday morning, we came to the conclusion that that word charge is a military term. This is literally Paul the Apostle saying to a young pastor, I command you. I command you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And so Paul is basically saying to Timothy, listen, he says, there is going to come a day where every human being, believer and non believer, is going to experience a judgment. For, for non believers, their sin's going to be judged, but for believers, there's going to come that event called the judgment seat of Christ where we give an account for our life. And Paul says, in light of the fact that every person is going to, at some point, stand before Jesus, he says, you need to boldly preach the Bible. He says, don't simply preach from the Bible. Don't read a scripture and spend the rest of the hour just kind of babbling he says, follow the example given to us by Ezra the priest. In Nehemiah chapter 8.8, 8, you'll remember in the book of Nehemiah, the wall is built and now Ezra begins to build the people. And how he builds the people is by getting up in front of them and he just read huge chunks of the Old Testament law. He read it. He explained it. He told them how to apply it. And he did this. You guys think I teach for a long time. Go read Nehemiah 8. Ezra taught all day, and the people stayed, and they listened to God's word. And Paul is saying, listen, Timothy, when you are gathered with the saints, you, you've got them for however long you got them. You better make the most of that time. And you do that by teaching the word in a systematic manner, which in my mind really means verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. You have to have a systematic way of getting through the scriptures. Read it, explain it, give an application and a bold instruction and exhortation for the people to obey what they've just heard. And this is why, verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn away their ear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And so Ezekiel and Jeremiah 
were both experiencing this in their ministries. They were boldly preaching God's word to a group of people that didn't want sound doctrine. They didn't want to hear that the Babylonians were coming. They didn't want to hear that they needed to turn from their sin. They wanted to hear something that tickled their ears. So a group of prophets were speaking in Jerusalem and there in Babylon as well, and they were basically saying the exact opposite. You know, this invasion is not going to last. We're going home soon. You know, people, it's going to be okay. Just don't listen to that Ezekiel guy. Don't listen to that Jeremiah guy. And it's interesting, if you study these guys' lives, they suffered greatly for their faithfulness to preach the word. Jeremiah, beaten, imprisoned. Ezekiel was faithful, and his ministry cost him the life of his wife. You know, these guys suffered in the midst of preaching the word, being faithful to the Lord and to his word, invited and brought hardship into their lives. And yet, these men faithfully evangelized. They faithfully fulfilled their call. And so, I see Ezekiel 33 as the Old Testament. Oh, I missed verse 5. He says, but you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. And so, Paul says to Timothy, you got to be different. You, you can't just do what all the other religious leaders are doing. You've got to follow this pattern that I've set. Teach the word. Be bold. Don't, don't be scared to talk about sin. Confront it and help people overcome it. And so that's what Ezekiel and Jeremiah were attempting to do. I do see Ezekiel 33 as the Old Testament counterpart to 2 Timothy 4. At least it's one of them. In the same way that Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, God is now going to say to Ezekiel, you be faithful and you preach my word to the people. And so in a moment, we're going to see God call Ezekiel to a very specific ministry called watchmen. But before he does that, look back at verses 1 through 6, God's going to establish the principle of the Old Testament watchmen and I want to make sure we all understand this. So we've seen Ezekiel's call to be a watchman in chapter 3. If you remember back then, God called him to be a watchman over the people of Israel, or Judah. Um, but he was at that time overseeing their judgment. Here in chapter 33, God calls Ezekiel as a watchman for the second time, and it's to oversee the nation's restoration. So look at verse 1 again. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people. These are the Jews living in um, Judah, right there. And he says, say to them, when I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity." but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you know this, you've heard this in the past. Ancient cities employed men called watchmen and their sole purpose was to scan the horizon for invading armies. That was their entire job, was just to keep their eyes on the horizon. If they saw a threat and they sounded the alarm, they could rest assured that regardless of how the citizens of their nation or city responded, they would never be held responsible for the outcome. They had been faithful to do what they were employed to do, merely sound the alarm, and then people had to choose how they were going to respond. But if he saw a threat and he failed to sound the alarm so that people didn't have an opportunity to find safety, God says, that man would be held responsible for the death of every citizen in that city. 
But notice something. Go back here. Verse 2. It says here, when I bring the sword upon a land. And so God is speaking here of how he can bring a foreign nation as an agent of judgment against another nation, specifically at this case talking about the Jewish people. The prophet, the uh, watchman in this scenario here is obviously a prophet. And so God says, this prophet has a sacred responsibility to warn the people that God's judgment was on the horizon and that they needed to respond appropriately. They needed to find safety. If the prophet sounded the warning, that prophet could rest assured that he would never be held responsible for the death of the citizens in that city because he had been faithful to fulfill his call. But if the prophet was unfaithful and he didn't sound the warning, God's going to hold him accountable for everybody that he failed to warn. Now in verse 7, this becomes personal. God now appoints Ezekiel as the spiritual watchman over his people. Let's look at verses 7 through 11, and this is where God takes the, the principle of the watchman, and he now makes it personal for Ezekiel. Verse 7, he says, So you, son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, verse 9, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. So here in this text, God is calling Ezekiel to become the spiritual watchman of the nation. and He was called to deliver God's word in a manner that reminded the people that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. If they continued in their sin, they were going to die. But if they were to recognize their sin and turn from their sin, God says, I'm not going to require you to pay for your sin with your life. He's promising that when the Babylonians show up, they may get carried off to Babylon or scattered to some other place, but, but God says, listen, your repentance is going to result in you staying alive. Now, there's one reference to this in the New Testament that we should talk about. Because the Apostle Paul, remember, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, but he was the most Jewish man on the planet according to his own testimony, right? So Paul, as he's headed for Jerusalem, and he's got this sense, and it's been confirmed through prophecy, that he's about to go into a season of intense trial and tribulation in his life. And so as he's sailing back to Jerusalem, he calls for the elders of the church at Ephesus. He tells them to meet him at the town of Miletus, and he has some fellowship with them. And he tells them, you know, some of you are never going to see my face again. But I want to read to you from Acts chapter 20 here. And in Acts chapter 20, about verse 27, Paul says this, verse 26. I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Where did Paul get this? Obviously, Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33. Let me keep reading. He says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that from within the church, false teachers would rise up. From outside the church, heresy and trouble would come into the church. And I love the fact that Paul looks at these Ephesian elders and he's, he's basically exhorting them to be faithful. And he says, I'm just going to use this little phrase from the book of Ezekiel, but anybody who knew their Bible would realize that what Paul was saying to these elders at Ephesus is you guys better be faithful because you're the ones that are called 
to warn God's people that trouble is on the horizon. It may not be Babylonians, but it's the enemy of our soul. And so Paul says to them, be faithful to preach the gospel and be faithful when people get saved because of your gospel preaching to present to them the whole counsel of God's word so that one day they will stand before the Lord as a complete person. But, but Paul talks to the leaders of the church and he says, you better be faithful because you're going to be held accountable for your ministry. And so I'm sobered tonight as I'm reading this and teaching this to you. I want to be sure that I'm faithful to God's word. And you know, there's a lot of times where I stand up here and there's a, a, a portion of the text we're reading through and I'm like, I just don't want to teach it. I wonder if anybody would notice if I just skipped over those three verses that talk about, you know, hard stuff, but I never do it because I want to make sure that what the Lord has to say gets to its intended ears. We're doing Cultivate right now. So we got about 25 youth that are coming. And uh, yesterday was my day to teach. And I, I taught on the fundamentals of the Holy Spirit and the fundamental of the Word of God. And I laid out some really tough challenges before our young people. And a parent told us tonight, you know, my son came home and, and responded to what you taught yesterday. And I was standing there trying to hold my cool, but deep down inside I'm going, yeah, you know. I said some hard things to those young people yesterday and it bore some fruit. It was so, so cool. Keep praying for cultivate throughout the rest of this week. Look at verses 10 through 11. This is cool because God prepares Ezekiel to respond to the arguments the Jewish people are gonna give him. It's like, hey, Ezekiel, you know what? You're gonna preach the word. Not everybody's gonna receive it. That's kind of crazy, huh? Imagine that. So he says, they're going to argue with you, but, but I want you to know what their argument's going to be. And so verse 10, he says, Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how, how can we then live? So God is basically saying to Ezekiel, you know, as you confront the people in Israel with their sin, the people in Judah with their sin, they're going to agree with you. Yes, we have sinned. We have sinned, but then they're going to respond in a manner that reveals that they don't understand God or, or God's character. They're, they're going to argue that they've been given over to sin for so long that they know their sin is going to result in God's judgment, but they don't think that there's anything that they can do to reverse their situation. They're basically saying, you know, my sin requires me to die. I see that in the scriptures, and, and God's about to delight as I get what I deserve. And aren't there so many people that think like that? God just can't wait to squish me like a bug. You know, I see what you did, Randy. You know, that's, that's kind of what they're saying. And it would be kind of like a backslidden Christian today saying, I, I'm just too far gone. I have gone so far from God and from his plan that, that God would never take me back no matter what I did. And notice what Ezekiel is instructed to respond with. In verse 11, God says, say to them. In other words, God is saying, Ezekiel, need to be prepared to meet this lie with my truth. They're, they're going to respond with a lie. God will never take me back. And this is what I want you to say. As I live, says the Lord, and if you've studied the Bible in the past, you know that's legal language, that that's God taking an oath that what he's about to say is true. And he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? I just love that verse. Don't you love that verse? God, God basically said, Ezekiel, the, the people are going to respond to your message and tell you that they really believe a lie about me. They, they think that I really enjoy sending people to death but I want you to come back and I want you to explain to them that I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. My pleasure is found when wicked people turn from God and they turn back to me. Did I say turn from God? Turn to God. And 
So I, I think a great verse to explain what we just read is to look at the New Testament equivalent to it. First John 1, 9. We all know this. John is writing, he says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And both Ezekiel and John point out a couple of things. First of all, that God is just. They're saying that God's holiness requires that every sin receive a just penalty. Ezekiel told the people of Judah that their sin would soon result in their death at the hands of the Babylonians. But God also pointed out that he's not sadistic and he's not cruel. He doesn't want to see anybody die. He doesn't take any delight when the wages of sin results in a person's death. And then both Ezekiel and John point out that God is, notice, faithful. God is faithful. He, he says if a person confesses and repents of their sin, God absolutely delights in forgiving them and, and in some way, and this is cool, modifying the consequences. I chose how I worded that really well. I changed it about five times today. Modifying the consequences. They were about to suffer physical death at the hands of the Babylonians, and God says, if you will confess and turn away from your sins, I'm going to modify the consequences. You are not going to die, but you're going to go live in Babylon for the rest of your life. There's going to be consequences, right? You and I have an even greater promise in the Scriptures being under the new covenant because when we trust in the finished work of Jesus, what he did for us on the cross, our consequences are modified also. We came in this world under the curse of sin and we're living under the curse of sin. And if we die under the curse of sin, our eternal destination is the smoking section. Hell. God says, when you turn from your sin, I modify your future. You may still have some earthly consequences. You know, if you get caught doing some of the things that you were doing before, you may spend a few years behind bars. You may live the rest of your life with a sexually transmitted disease. You know, you, you may have some earthly consequence, but God says your eternal destination is no longer hell, it's heaven. And God says, I rejoice in doing these things. And so in verse 12, God gives Ezekiel a message for his people. And the message is important for you and I to listen to tonight. The message is found in verses 12 through 20. And we'll just simply title it like this. Behavior matters. Behavior matters, okay? This is extremely relevant for you and I. I'm going to read all the way from 12 to 16 here. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, again, so this is the Jewish people, people living in Jerusalem, waiting for the Babylonians to come in 586 and just destroy the city. He says, the, righteous of the, right, no, I'm sorry, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life, Without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Now, I don't know if you caught this as we're reading through these verses, but Ezekiel just described two people. And the first person is in a state of backsliding. He was once on fire for the Lord, walking with the Lord, living according to God's word, 
But now he's practicing sin. Now remember, this is under the old covenant. Now when Babylon comes, this man is going to die because he'll be judged according to his present state. Now there's a second person being described here, and this person has lived an extremely sinful life, a long life of sin, but he recently made a decision to repent, and he turned back to God. And if if you notice, he started bearing fruit of repentance. Basically, if you've stolen something, make restoration. You know, he's bearing the fruit of repentance. This is genuine repentance. And God says, when Babylon shows up, even though this dude has lived a horrible life of sin, he's right now living in repentance. That man's going to live. Look at verse 17. Yet the children of your people say, the way of the Lord is not fair. But it is their way which is not fair, says the Lord, basically. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Look at verse 20. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Oh, house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. Well, that's one way that the New Testament is much better than the old, right? When we're in Christ, we're not judged according to our ways. We're made righteous because of our faith in Christ. So Ezekiel's audience obviously didn't like the message that he was preaching. Now, it wasn't the second part of the message that they didn't like. They had no problem with horrible, wicked sinners not paying the price for their sin. What they had a problem with is people who they perceived as being righteous who were now in a state of backsliding and practicing sin. They didn't think it was fair for God to judge them because in the past they had done so many good things. And so God turns around and and he says, that just really reveals how how dark your heart is. It, It reveals that that you just don't understand what I'm trying to communicate to you. Now, there is a New Testament application to this. You know, and let me just be bold. Under the Old Covenant, and people really struggle with this, God's people physically died for disobedience. I mean, that's sometimes a hard pill for us to swallow. But this is what this chapter is all about. God is saying the Babylonians are coming and they are coming to righteously judge what's going on in the life of each person. And even if this person was righteous for many years, but right now they're living a life of of practicing sin, God says, that's where they are right now and that's how I'm going to have to deal with them. The opposite for the sinner that's living a righteous life. That's the old covenant But there is a New Testament application to this. And again, I have to point out what we're reading about tonight in Ezekiel 33. This is Old Testament. This is under the Old Covenant. This has nothing to do with a believer losing their salvation. Sometimes people will say, hey, I found a portion of Scripture that makes it super clear that if you backslide, you're going to lose your salvation. Listen, this is is not about New Testament salvation. This is Old Testament. Testament, literally losing your life. There is a principle here that we need to talk about because a lot of believers feel like once they're in Christ, their behavior does not matter. Like, hey man, I'm saved by grace. I can do anything I want. Stop judging me, dude. Right? How many of us have talked to a Christian like that? Like, dude, now that I'm saved, I could smoke anything I want in Jesus' name. Right? I'm a Christian bank robber. God told me it's okay for me and my girlfriend to live together. You know? There's a principle in the Old Testament and the New Testament that our behavior reflects the condition of our relationship with God. And that's what this text is about. I'm going to show you two New Testament texts that may make you extremely uncomfortable tonight, but I want to tell you that these are extreme cases we're looking at. And so be careful what you do with these verses. But 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 31, Paul is talking about communion. 
and how to prepare yourself for communion. Notice what he says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Boy, I tell you what, scholars have just written volumes about what it means to take communion in an unworthy manner. But Paul explains it in the next line. He says, notice, let a man examine himself and so, or and then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Basically, Paul is saying this, we don't want to participate in communion flippantly. I just came from robbing a bank, and I did tithe on the way in. I dropped 10% in the agape box. Oh, it's a communion service. Praise the Lord, you know. And I'm going to take communion tonight. And Paul says, let, let's talk about this. First of all, if you spent a little bit of time examining yourself, you would realize I should probably not take communion tonight. I should probably make an appointment with one of the pastors tomorrow and talk about my bank robbing habit get this under control. But Paul says, listen, the idea is you examine yourself, you invite the Holy Spirit to, 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 to enter into your thought process, and you say, reveal anything in me, sins that I'm practicing, not something I slipped into, I stubbed my toe and, and, and lost my temper. You probably confess that in the moment, but, but God, show me things I'm practicing that are ungodly that would make a mockery of the cross. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree, that is sin. And in my heart, I'm going to repent. But my intention is to walk out of those doors and live out my repentance. Paul says, brother, take communion tonight. Celebrate your forgiveness. But if you're saying, you know, with crocodile tears, I got to stop doing this. And you know for a fact you're going to go out that door and you're going to continue in that sin. Paul says, do not take communion. Why? He says, he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And I'm not going to explain all of this tonight. I don't have time, but he does say this. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Paul just clearly said that we can be so far down the road of sinful rebellion with a hard heart, coming to church, taking communion like it's nothing, Paul says to the Corinthians, many among you in your church have become weak. Some have become physically ill. And some have died. I'll show you another one. 1 John 5, 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask... And the Lord will give him life for those who commit sin, not leading to death. And again, I can't explain all this tonight. We don't have time. But I want to point something out. It's right here. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Now, this is a very difficult passage. And I'm not going to explain all of it, but I want to make crystal clear that John said that there are times when a believer sin so badly that they've compromised their Christian witness, their Christian testimony, and it appears from this text that God ends their life on earth and brings the believer to heaven. And someone might say, well, hey, getting to heaven early is a good deal. Until you consider that we're all going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for what did we do with our life since the time we met Christ. And I believe if I understand the whole concept correctly, this person that we're reading about here in 1 Corinthians and 1 John, they're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. They're not going to lose their salvation. They are going to lose their rewards and their responsibilities in the eternal kingdom. And so for just a little bit of fun and sin here on earth, and my experience is that sin that starts out fun usually just isn't fun anymore. It just leaves you guilty. And it's going to cost you what the Lord had in store for you. In eternity, we better wrap this up. We get to verse 21 through 33. We see the arrival of a messenger. And this is a very huge turning point in Ezekiel's book. This is where a bunch of Ezekiel's prophecies are now confirmed. People are seeing that Ezekiel is a true prophet. Verse 30. 
or verse 21, it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity, in the 10th month, on the 5th day of the month, that one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been captured. The date was January 9th, 585 B.C., and a man arrives in Tel Abib. He's come from the city of Jerusalem. He's traveled across the desert. If you do your homework in the dates, it's taken him over seven months. He's traveled, what did I tell you guys in the early uh, chapters, about 1,500 miles? Was it 900 or 1,500 miles from Jerusalem to this area? And he gets to... Ezekiel, and he says, the Babylonians have conquered Jerusalem. Most people are dead. A few of us have escaped. And we get to verse 22. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me the evening before the man came who had escaped. And he had opened my mouth. So when he came to me in the morning, my mouth was opened and I was no longer mute. In chapter 3, God told him, listen, Ezekiel, you're going to be mute from now until the fall of Jerusalem, until the news gets to you of the fall of Jerusalem. Until that time, all you're going to do is be able to preach what I tell you. The rest of the time, you're not going to be able to speak. Ezekiel says, you know what? I'm free. I can now speak. I can talk. And we're going to see what he does as he preaches God's word. And so this guy comes And Ezekiel is now excited because what we're going to see from this point on, he's no longer just a prophet. He's about to become pastor, shepherd to the Jewish people living in Babylon. And in these final verses, God has Ezekiel confront two groups of people. And the first, I I chuckle at this one. You're going to enjoy this, I think. The first are the survivors in Jerusalem. So, Babylon has come in. They have wiped out the city. Tons of people dead. Tons of people carried off. There's a few stragglers in the land, okay? And and I just, I want you to see what they think here. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, they who inhabit those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land has been given to us as a possession. Now, I don't know if you see what I see here, but it's pretty clear that these survivors, people who had been judged, God allowed them to live. They're in the land, and they're basically saying, we're going to compare ourselves to Abraham. It was through Abraham that God birthed this wonderful nation of ours. Through just one man, he birthed our nation. And they kind of look around at each other and they say, you know who we are? We're that righteous remnant that God has left in the land. And through us, he's going to rebirth the nation of Israel. We're like the new Abraham. I wonder if they called themselves that. Hey, we're the new Abraham. I don't know what they might have called themselves. And so look at Ezekiel's response. God says, Ezekiel, say this to them. Thus says the Lord God, You eat meat with blood. Well, that was a breaking of the Old Testament law. You lift up your eyes towards your idols. That was a breaking of the Old Testament law. And you shed blood. That also was. And so God says, should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword. You commit abominations and you defile one another's wives. Should you then possess the land? And Ezekiel is supposed to send a message to these people and say, basically, so you're the new Abraham, huh? You remember some things about Abraham? He was a righteous man. Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. You guys are a bunch of, like, wicked sinners. You're, you're worse than anybody I know. And God's going to use you to rebirth the nation of Israel? He says, I, I think God has another plan. Verse 27, say thus to them, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely those who are in the ruins shall fall by the sword. And the one who is in the open field, I will give him to the beasts to be devoured. And those who are in the strongholds and caves shall die of the pestilence. For I will make the land most desolate, her arrogant strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass through. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. When I have made the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. 
God says, I left you alive when everybody else died. You should have looked to me and said, Lord, I don't know why you saved us, but we're turning back to you. And God says to them, so you think in your arrogance that I'm going to use you wicked people to restart a nation. Uh Uh-uh. Expected a different response, but (laughs) the second group that Ezekiel is supposed to respond to or, or, or confront um, are found in verse 30 through the end of the chapter. And these are the Jews in Babylon that Ezekiel was now pastoring. To, to use a New Testament term, these are the members of his church. And he says, as for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses. That would make me uncomfortable if the Lord spoke to me and said, hey, Randy, um, the people at Calvary are talking about you. I would be like, again? Lord, what are they saying? But, but this is a good one. Look what happens. It says, they speak to one another. Everyone's saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. You got to come hear my pastor preach, Right? So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words. But they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. But their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. This second group here is Ezekiel's flock. This is the group of people he's trying to shepherd and to pastor. And they talked about him in a positive way because they liked their pastor. And they loved to hear him preach. In fact, they loved his preaching so much that they would go find their friends and say, you got to come to church with us and hear Pastor Ezekiel preach the word. In fact, they said, man, it's, it's, when Ezekiel preaches, it's like listening to the most amazing musician singer. It is the best. The problem is, is that they listened to Ezekiel to be entertained, but they didn't listen to Ezekiel to obey. And so verse 33, we have the last verse of our chapter. When, when this comes to pass, and surely it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. Scholars don't agree as to what God was referring to about what would come to pass that would prove that Ezekiel is a true prophet. Um, Some say that it was the fall of Jerusalem, but as we read this, that had already taken place. And so I, I personally X that one out as a possibility. Others say that it was the fulfillment of that prophecy against the remnant in Judah, how God was going to wipe them out. But I don't really see how that would impact the Jews living in Babylon. I'm having a hard time believing that that's what it was. Um, I have an opinion, and I'll just share with you up front, this is nothing but my opinion. But it comes because I think I can relate to this. I'm, I'm a pastor who preaches the word, And Ezekiel was a pastor preaching the word at the time. And so what I really believe is that Ezekiel saw the people as his flock. He saw himself as their shepherd, and he was faithful to be the watchman that God had called them to be, called him to be earlier in the chapter. He realized God told me that watchman thing because pretty soon I'm going to transfer from being a prophet to being a pastor. I'm going to be a shepherd here. And I need to remember that my job is to preach the truth to them, to give them the whole counsel of God's word. And so I believe that Ezekiel was faithfully preaching the word of God. But these people continued in disbelief and disobedience. And as their lives went on, they began to experience the consequences of of sitting under the teaching of God's word only for entertainment, but not for sanctification. And they began to reap 
what happens when you come to church and just listen but never do anything. And so families are probably falling apart and men are getting fired from their jobs because Ezekiel preached on not stealing from your boss, but they did it anyway. And, you know, <clears throat> they begin to realize this man is a genuine messenger of God. He's speaking the truth of God's word. He's reading it. He's explaining it. He's telling us how to apply it. And he's even saying, if you don't apply it, there will be consequences and we're starting to experience those consequences in our own life. And we are coming to realize this guy wasn't sent to entertain us. This guy was sent to bring the truth of God's word that our lives would be sanctified. And so I'll give you a couple of takeaways for tonight. Ezekiel had a really hard task. As you study his life, he did suffer a lot. He was faithful in the midst of the hardships that ministry brought into his life. So I want to say to you, if God has given you some platform in life where you have the absolute privilege of speaking truth to others, especially if it's the platform of speaking God's word to others, it is going to cost you something. But do it. And do it faithfully. Preach the word and let God's word do what your words cannot do. And then second is that Ezekiel's flock, his church, loved their pastor. They were always present. They loved to hear him preach. They even invited others to hear him preach. But they were not faithful to apply God's word to their own lives. And so don't ever make the mistake of seeing church as just another source of entertainment. See church as what Ephesians 4.11 calls it, the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for transforming our lives. Ephesians 4 talks about the fact that as church leaders are faithful to preach the word and to equip saints for the work of the ministry, that this mysterious thing happens where we become unified in what we believe and how we live. We come to the maturity and the fullness of Christ. And so I will say this to you, church, and to those of you online who I've never met, but I love you guys. I love you guys. I love the ministry. And my commitment to you is that I will continue preaching the word, whether it costs me or not. And then I will ask you to pray that God would continue to teach you to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Because James says that that is self-deception. So, Father, tonight, Ezekiel 33 has, I think, given us a lot to think about. And so, in this closing prayer, Lord, I, I want to accomplish a couple of things. I, things I'm praying for myself and for this church that I have been called to oversee. And, and I thank you, Lord, for the, the faithful partners. But my prayer for myself and for Calvary Chapel Greer is that we would understand the value of the Word of God. Read, explained, and then applied. And then we would realize, Lord, that like Ezekiel as a watchman, every one of us have been given people that were privileged to, we are privileged to speak truth into their lives. And I pray we would, we would speak the truth in love, seasoned with salt, but that we would speak the truth and then we would just allow your word to do what we can't do. It brings me great comfort to know, Lord, that when I teach your word, I'm no longer responsible for anything. The word has come from you to my heart, my mind, my soul, and, and then I get to, to preach it and speak it, and I've done my part. But I'm not content with that, Lord. I, I pray that by your Spirit, every person that hears your word would make a decision that they need to believe it as your word. They, they need to consider what was taught. Be like a Berean and go search the scriptures to see if what Pastor Randy said be true. And then having proved the truth, Lord, that everybody would decide, I am going to walk in the truth of God's word. 
I'm going to be saved and I'm going to allow God's word to sanctify me. God's word is going to prepare me for my ministry. God's word is going to continually cleanse me. But never, ever, ever let us become like these people we read about at the end of chapter 33 that loved to come to church. They loved to sing the songs. They loved to hear their pastor preach. And then they walked out of the building unchanged. God, never, ever, ever allow us to become that. And if we are that right now, Lord, may we repent. If we're anything like the people we read about in the scriptures tonight, Lord, that heard the truth and then just kind of mocked it. Paul said that some are weak, some are sick, some have even encountered death because of that heart attitude. Never, ever let us be that, God. And so as we get into this last section, Lord, and we get to see you making promises of restoration to Israel, I pray that here, Lord, in our church, people who have fallen away from you, people on the internet who are far from you right now, would hear your promises of restoration and allow you to bring them back to you, that they would choose repentance and return. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. Justice and free. 